as the designer. That's part of your responsibility as a total project control. Uh, the ST STC numerical value rating. Uh, it's digits, uh, decibel reduction in airborne sound. Typical requirement is 50 STC. Higher numbers relate to a better control. But typically, we see 50. Some more prestigious um, units, uh, higher end units, they're going to probably ask for a lot higher number. They want to make sure there's nothing coming through. Your sound measurement for impact, the IIC, impact insulation class. It's a measurement of the ability of the flooring system or underlayment to reduce the impact sound. The dropping of the bowling ball, the kid running up across the floor. Again, similar type of thing. We're looking at um, the requirement. Um, some areas it's 50. I'm used to typically impact is 55 to 60. Uh, that's what I'm used to in Los Angeles. Um, the higher the number, the better it is. And again, it comes together as a system. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at different a ceiling and floor assemblies. And um, we've got here tile on a six inch concrete floor with a suspended ceiling, insulation, and airspace. This is one way of testing. We get into a tile on an eight inch with a drywall ceiling below. All of these are adding to the overall um, ability for the floor to absorb sound or to absorb the impact. Tile on membranes over a plywood floor and again uh, an insulation space. All of these things are going to add to the overall effect of this um, uh, sound deadening system. We're looking at different methods to use. Whether we're using a thin set um, as a sound deadening material, a bonded membrane, liquid applied or a mortar, or an, um, a decoupling system, a uh, loose laid or um, sheet membrane. This uh, shows a performance comparison. And bottom line is as you're looking at uh, the yellow that's the best, you're looking at different combinations. And it gets down to cost per square foot, cost for the installation, cost for the material, and what's going to give you your best sound reduction. The bottom line is you as the designer and working with your client are looking for the best ROI the best return on investment. What does he want to spend? What's going to give him the best results on that? This chart, instead of trying to memorize it, if you'd like to get it, I'll be more than glad to give that to anybody. So we're just going to spend a few minutes on waterproofing, both interior and exterior. And um, you have your various codes that, re that require it. Um, your plumbing codes, your um, uh, UPC, uh, your IPC. Um, typically where we see the need for waterproofing, and we're going to spend just a couple of minutes because I want to spend, I want to make sure we don't run over and I want to spend most of the time on grout. But where we sit, need this, shower pans, um, typically we're all familiar with that. The other place to think about it is bathroom floors and multi-story units. When the water comes out of the shower pan, where is it going? Let's make sure the whole entire bathroom floor gets waterproof. It's not that inexpensive of an insurance. You're stacking kitchens in a multifamily unit. Let's waterproof the kitchen floor. The dishwasher overflows, sink overflows, that water's got to go somewhere. And if we can contain it in the kitchen so we can get it cleaned up, it's going to prevent a lot of problems from the, from the neighbors down below. The common, whoops, sorry about that. Common waterproofing methods, they were just showing the application. But I was getting kind of a high sign, so we're going to spend some time on grouting. Grouting for success. 10% of the job is grout. It's 90% of the problems, without a doubt. This is where we get in, uh, called in for most of our grout, our problems, is the grout. Modern grout types. We have Portland, uh, Portland cement, uh, which complies to your ANSI 118.7. It's polymer modified. It comes both sanded and non-sanded. Non-sanded grout, typically an eighth of an inch. Grout joint or less is non-sanded. Sanded grout, an eighth of an inch or more. You don't want to use a sanded grout with high polished marbles or softer um, uh, high glazed tiles because the sand will scratch it. We also have what's called a calcium aluminate cement or an HCT, epoxy grouts, and a furan. Remember, all Portland cement grouts are vulnerable to damage from early exposure to the elements may deteriorate when exposed to acid or alkali components, are susceptible to inconsistent color, are subject to efflorescence. 
In other words, folks, all cement grouts can discolor. No matter how good, no matter what the installation is going on, no matter how good that guy is, he can have a problem with it. Somebody leaves a door open and it dries faster on one side of the room than on the other, it'll discolor. The sun is beating through a window. It's causing it to dry faster than another area. It can shade. So this is a problem with cementitious grouts. If it happens, the installer didn't make a mistake. Maybe somebody should have talked about covering things up, but it's part of the properties of the cement grout. Climate conditions. A low humidity will uh, mean a faster drying time, a darker color. Opposite, high humidity, a slower drying time, a, a lighter color. Wind and drafts can cause uneven curing or a mottled color, direct sunlight, as I mentioned. The type of tile or stone. The more porous the tile or stone is, the more it's going to absorb <coughs> the moisture out of the grout, and it's going to cause the grout to, to dry faster. And you'll end up with a darker color. If it's uh, dry slower, it'll be a lighter color grout. If you're mixing two different types of tiles together, one has a higher absorption than the other, you can have a mottled grout joint. It's not a problem of the grout. It was the tile that was picked out. The wrong type of water. Oh my gosh, I've been in the country where they go down to a creek, pull out a bucket of water and use that for mixing their grout and expect they're not going to have a problem. The grout color will be just horrendous. Mixing too much water or washing with too much water can cause all kinds of problems. And the, the quality of the water. Um, it's got to be clear, clean water, rotated on a regular basis. Curing conditions, depending upon how they're curing it. Um, the, in the perfect world, they're going to put a construction paper over it. There's not going to be any winds or drafts on it. And I'll give you the hardest, best color on the grout. If they cover it with plastic, which I've seen done on jobs, what ends up happening, the moisture goes up onto the plastic, drips back down into the grout, and discolors it. You don't want to cover it with plastic. Efflorescence, oh, the bane of all grout installations. Efflorescence is caused by what's known as a free line. When cement hydrates, it puts off a line as part of the residual. That line lays in the bottom of the installation until moisture gets in there and starts pulling it towards the surface. And it, and it pulls this line, uh, which looks like a salt, up to the surface. When the moisture evaporates, what's left behind is this salt or efflorescence, white chalky uh, material. You'll see that on the exterior of buildings, brick installations, but it can happen in the residence also, uh, that they've used too much water to washing and everything looks fine. And a couple of days later, you come back in and you start seeing all this white chalkiness. What happened here? And what ended up happening, he used too much water to wash that joint. It was left, the water's working its way out. And because of that amount of water, it's pulled all of these salts to the surface and leaving them on the top. Efflorescence over a period of time will, will disappear, will go away. It's whether or not we have that much time, and it depends upon how much mortar is behind it. So on an exterior installation, if they've done a, a mortar bed first, the thin sets, the grouts, and they have an efflorescence, it's pulling all of the salts all the way through that system. To the, to the surface of it, and we got to get rid of all of it before the efflorescence will be gone. So it can be a real problem. There's another shot of efflorescence. Lovely. So we have what's called the HCT cement grout. What is it? A high, or it's a hydrated cement. It's a special proprietary type of cement used to eliminate the typical problems related to Portland cement grouts. Grout formulated with this HCT technology is ultra fast setting, uh, provides the truest and most color consistent results money can buy. Um, don't know about that. But what it means is, let's say if we were doing this floor and we started working on opposite sides of this floor grouting, as long as we had the grout out of the same batch, so we were making sure the colors were consistent, we could have that door open, the sun could be beating in here and it could be a perfect condition in the back. Everything will be the same color. You won't have effects on how that grout um, is drying because of the outside conditions. What it typically happens is if you look at a grout channel, which all of you have in your offices, um, and if you were to look at that grout channel, when grout dries, it dries from the outside in. So the air, the sun, all of these things 
are causing effects on it as it's drawing from the out part of the grout to the center. By using this technology, what happens is it starts drying from the inside out. So the outer effects don't, have, don't relate into any type of problems with discoloration, with modeling, with all of these other conditions because it's curing from the inside out. This type of grout can be used from an eighth of an inch to an inch wide grout joint. So it gives you a lot of realm um, for usage for this type of a grout. The, some of the other benefits. It's a consistent color. It's easy to use. It, it spreads and cleans up like a traditional grout. One of the advantages of this, this type of a grout is that typically when a, gen, when a, a contractor grouts a floor, he walks away from it. The next day, he has to come back and dust it. There's a film on it. And if he doesn't dust that right away, and he leaves it, lets that film set for a couple of days, it can actually etch into the tile. And then he needs to get into using some sort of an acid to clean it. With this type of technology, he can leave that film for a couple of days, come in with a dry rag, and it'll wipe right off without any problem at all. Has less curing time, um, which means less downtime, reduced uh, and reduce time needed for protecting the installation. It has the strength of a traditional grout in 72 hours, what a traditional grout takes 28 days to cure out. So you're looking at uh, some labor savings and, of course, fewer callbacks. And it also ex exceeds the ANSI standards uh, for a polymer modified uh, grout for both interior and exterior applications. Um, this is an excellent type of grout for using anytime you're doing outside work. I would recommend using a grout that has this technology in it. And it's showing really quick how this works to get, get a better idea. Uh, when you're looking at this uh, cement grout and you're looking at the various particles in there, this is before the reaction with water. So everything is compressed together, the sand, the cement, the pigments, um, the uh, polymers, all compressed together. When you add water, it pushes it apart. The more water you add um, to a grout, the further it's going to push it apart and leaving voids and such in it. On a traditional uh, cement grout, those voids is what allows the efflorescence to come on up and through. On this HCT technology, those voids are a, are a lot smaller, so you're not creating that type of a problem. So basically, with the HCT technology, efflorescence is a thing of the, it can be a thing of the past. So it reduces color complaints, eliminates efflorescence, increases productivity, increases quality, and you save money on the long run on your ROI, your labor, and your reputation. All right, one of the things we know about tile and grout, the biggest thing that people don't like is the grout discolors. It becomes a dirt collector, the tile gutter. And how do we take care of this? What is the surefire way that all your grout is always going to look the same? Cement grouts, traditionally, people will seal them. But even with sealer, over a period of time, it's still going to darken just by walking on it. Stuff still is impacted. It's a cement. It's porous. So what we're looking at is how do we get to a customer that wants to use a light-colored grout, and six months from now, it's still that good-looking, light-colored grout? getting away from this grout gutter, and what we're looking at is going into an epoxy. Epoxy is resistant to most stains and chemicals. Uh, so where you're seeing it used in a residential application, kitchens especially, you're throwing the party, the red wine across the countertop, somebody doesn't wipe it up, you come back the next day on a cement grout, it's stained. End of discussion. With an epoxy, let it sit there, come back the next day, wipe it up ketchup, mustard, all of the things that you would use in the, in the home, you find around the kitchen, no problem. Bleach, you spill a bottle of bleach on it. It's not going to discolor it. You take a, a beautiful mocha colored grout, spill a bottle of bleach on it, you got white grout. It's going to take the color out. Um, it's ideal for you where you want that light color because it can be cleaned up, brought back, and it's going to look like the original installation. When you're talking about epoxies, make sure that you're talking about 100% solids epoxies. There's some products on the market that are part cement. They're what's called a modified epoxy. And if they have any type of cement in them, they're not going to be as uh, resistant to chemicals. The various things that break down the cement will still break down that grout. 
So certain acids and such.